organization is Southeast RCAP. We are lovely referred to as CERCAP. If you ever are looking for help with your water, wastewater, or wells, please give us a call. We do have also um, pump out septic tanks in rural communities to help the Chesapeake Bay. Thank you. Everybody has a pretty good idea of what uh, uranium mining is about, and I think they'd like to keep this for 15 or 20 minutes, so I'm going to move through these quickly. I think there are copies of the presentation. But uh, in Virginia, uranium mining <coughs> involves digging up a lot of rock. It's really like solid granite. Uh, somewhere between 1,000 and 2,000 pounds of rock for every one pound of uranium. You grind that rock into the finest powder and sand-like particles that you can. You leach it out in either acid or caustic solution. Um, you separate about 85% of the uranium comes out, uh, which has only about 15% of the radioactivity of the ore. Um, and that is, that is the product. And now you have this, essentially, for every pound of uranium, you have 1,000 to 2,000 pounds of ground up um, tailings that you have to dispose of. And unlike um, uh, their original condition, where they were locked in solid rock and not going anywhere, they now are capable being moved by air. In the case of Virginia Beach is concerned, they can be moved by water. Um, uh, in, in the case of the um, Coles Hill mine, the single mine, uh, the, the volume we're talking about of these tailings is anywhere from 20 to 76 million cubic yards of tailings. Uh, the model we're going to show you today is based on the 20 million smaller project, which I think is the um, is what's economically uh, feasible for the company right now. But the company often touts the uh, benefits of 120 million pounds of uranium, and uh, that's the bigger project, and that will generate uh, uh, four times as much uh, uh, tailings. Uh, so what's a million cubic yards? Now trash more than a million cubic yards. Uh, and these uh, tailings have to be um, secured in some kind of uh, uh, confinement cell for basically forever. Um, it can be above grade, and think of Lamont Trashmore as an above grade confinement cell for um, domestic solid waste, or they could be below grade, think about taking Mount Trashmore, turning it upside down, and sinking it into the ground. That would be more like a below grade impoundment. And that will become important, but I'll mention that uh, as, we get, as we move along. So our concern is that in Virginia, the most likely location for these tailings is a geologic formation known as the Triassic Rift. It occurs essentially at the foothills of the Appalachians. It runs uh, all along from northern Virginia all the way down through southern Virginia uh, into North Carolina, also up into the uh, northern states. Uh, but in Virginia, and you can see this map, and I've got some circles highlighted there, the red areas on that map, okay, it's shown as red, um, those are places where 30 years ago uh, the Marline and Union Carbide corporations who uh, thought they might do some mining in Virginia had identified that these were some likely places they would explore. Uh, there's, uh, the National Academy of Sciences has said that basically anywhere up and down Route 29 uh, is a potential for uh, exploration. There was one site uh, in all of this that actually outcropped, meaning that the ore body actually penetrated the ground and some of it was uh, exposed uh, above ground that's basically a piece of solid granite. And when they were driving around through the area with guide counters, they went off uh, uh, prominently, and that's the Coles Hill site. Nobody knows at this point whether there are, where the Coles Hill is a geologic um, oddity, a unique site, and that there's, it would be the only potential mine, or if, there's possi or if there's a possibility of many, many mines into the future uh, all along Route 29. Coles Hill is the only one to know about. I think it's a pretty safe bet that if mining goes forth, there will be a lot more exploration uh, looking for it. There hasn't been any significant exploration looking for uranium in Virginia. Again, they discovered the Coles Hill site accidentally. Uh, but if, Coles, if the mining goes forth, believe me, they'll be drilling all up and down Route 29 looking for more uranium. Uh, there's a map of the United States, a lot of information on that map. All the small little colored uh, dots you see are places where the USGS has measured extreme stream flows. We're talking about numbers on the orders of uh, uh, 50 to 100 times normal stream flow uh, on a square mile basis for uh, watershed in Virginia. The large black dots are places where we've had precipitation events approaching uh, what they call the probable maximum precipitation, the most rain that can fall at any one time. 
you think you've uh, seen uh, a lot of rainfall in the last 30 years in Virginia, you've probably seen the most intense rainfall, mm -hmm. maybe about an inch or an inch and a half per hour. A PMP event uh, approaches five to six inches of uh, rain per hour for about a six to 12 hour period. Uh, it's essentially the 100 year storm multiplied by four to six times. Um, there's a, a big bunch of those uh, intense stream flows and PMP events in the middle of the country. That's the result of uh, where, what they call Dixie Alley and Tornado Alley, where cold uh, Canada, Canadian air combines with an infinite source of moisture from the Gulf, and they create these intense uh, supercells that give rise to tornadoes. You see a distinct uh, concentration along the eastern flank of the Appalachians running from essentially Maine all the way down through into Georgia. Uh, that is where essentially an unlimited source of moisture from the Atlantic can pile up against the Appalachians. The Appalachians acts as a shoehorn to shove the moisture to the top of the atmosphere and under the right conditions it can come out um, uh, very quickly. That's uh, the result of about a century's worth of PMP events. Uh, uh, that map also shows you where these uh, 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 deposits in uh, Pennsylvania County occur. And you can see that if you drew a line through these PMP events, you would cut right through the um, deposits in Virginia and the Coles Hill deposit. In fact, closer to home, two of those dots, black dots on that map, are shown right there. The Nelson County uh, event in 1969, Madison County in 1995, and then you can see the um, uh, former mining leases where the Coles Hill site is. You can draw a line straight through them. Uh, and the point that concerns us is, where these deposits exist in the same place is very, uh, has a high potential for these kinds of uh, PMP events. So the National Academy of Sciences did a study. Uh, if you haven't seen it, I, I uh, suggest you get on their webpage and look it up. It's very easy to find. They have a nice 20-page uh, summary. Basically, they concluded that uh, mining did have potential uh, to affect the uh, long-term environment of Virginia. And they particularly uh, singled out our extreme natural events uh, earthquakes, uh, incredible precipitation events, and even that lead up to debris flows and things like that, and indicated that taming cells, if not done properly, uh, certainly have the probability to cause a problem. So the city uh, uh, council directed our staff to say, well, what if uh, there was a problem? This was right around the time of the uh, uh, Gulf, the oil well blowout in the Gulf, when this was brought forward. Uh, city Council said, well, what if there was an accident? I know everybody says there won't be, but what if there is one? Um, and so they told us to go prepare a model, and we have, and I'll show you the results today. Now, this model doesn't simulate why a disposal cell might fail. <coughs> Typically, these kinds of failures are the result of uh, unforeseen uh, natural events, unforeseen technical events, and perhaps some little mismanagement on the human error on the, on the uh, management side, both in the regulatory and perhaps the company side, they all tend to come together and they create this uh, catastrophe. We're not trying to simulate that, we're just trying to say if a catastrophic uh, precipitation event, such as the one that hit Nelson County in 69, were to cause an above ground um, confining cell to fail and bring down a lot of tailings downstream, what would be the water quality impacts downstream? It's kind of a worst case scenario for a single cell failure. Any mine, uh, is going to have eight, to more, eight or more of these disposal cells, and two would be open at any time. Uh, but we modeled just a single failure and on the Bannister River. Our model did show that if uh, the same failure occurred on the Roanoke uh, River watershed, the impacts would be about double because the Roanoke River uh, has much more carrying capacity to move these sediments, so they're kind of heavy. So you need to have a big river to move them. I will say it's a very unlikely event. It's not supposed to happen. Uh, regulations and technology are supposed to prevent it. However, here are just some water-based issues in the last few years of where uh, technology and regulations were supposed to prevent uh, accidents. And if they had, uh, and if you had approached the owners of these, uh, um, uh, uh, of these operations a week or two before the event and said, listen, I think there's a possibility you might have a catastrophe, they would have looked at you like you were crazy and told you to go on home, that we have it under control, that we have the best regulation, the best engineers, and the best uh, contractors in the business. But nevertheless, uh, from time to time, even though it's rare, these things do happen. Now, Virginia Uranium has criticized our model. 
Uh, I would need an hour here to walk you through each criticism. I'll use a worn out pun. None of it holds water, except for, um, thank you, uh, except for one. They pointed out that they say that they intend to bury these uh, uh, tailings underground, not have them above ground, and therefore, if they're buried underground, uh, they won't escape to the surface environment, and we actually agree with that. Okay, that's a, uh, uh, if in fact um, uh, you take these uh, tailings and bury them below ground, a lot less likelihood, uh, in fact, a very remote likelihood that they can escape to the surface waters. Now, obviously, that's, there's a groundwater issue there. Um, I will say that uh, uh, the NRC regulations do make exceptions. And they favor groundwater, uh, underground disposal, but they make exceptions if economics or environmental issues get in the way. And um, 30 years ago, the Marline Carbide Corporations uh, ruled that uh, the, the groundwater conditions would not support below grade impounds. Um, there's been one mine licensed in 30 years. The preferred technical solution was to have this tailings buried below ground. Um, that's what the regulation said. But the company came back and said, we're going to have to blast all this rocks, it's going to cost all this money. And so they were allowed to build these uh, uh, disposal cells above ground. In Colorado, uh, where uh, they think um, uh, 12 inches of rainfall in two weeks, by the way, that's what you've read about all the flooding in California, that's the result of 12 inches of rainfall in two weeks. 12 inches of rainfall, I've seen three times since I've been uh, working for the city uh, in a day. Okay, that's not an unusual event in, in Virginia, and again, in a PMP event, you may recall that map, they didn't show any of those PMP events in Colorado. There's no, there's no source of moisture. Uh, but um, uh, we're talking about 30 to uh, 40 inches of rainfall in 6 to 12 hours. And so it's nothing like what you're seeing in Colorado. The uh, company's own feasibility studies today do not, uh, are not based upon below-grade storage. They're based upon above-grade storage. Uh, and um, the NRC has basically said, you know, there's no assurance you can have below grade storage because if there is a water quality problem with groundwater, you're going to have to bring more above grade. And there was some legislation proposed in the last General Assembly that certainly uh, mm. suggested that these uh, uh, confined cells would be underground, but it only required that the company original, that their original application for a permit be based on below ground storage. These permits can be pending in front of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission for five to ten years, and many things can change, including whether or not they're below grade or above grade. Essentially, there is no legal way that um, uh, Virginia could mandate today that these would be below grade uh, if, in the future, some economic or environmental conditions mandated that they be below grade. So our model uh, looked at only three uh, contaminants. There's a lot more, but these for most of the uh, uh, radioactivity. Uh, I'm only going to deal with radium. We don't have enough time to... Uh, radium was the worst issue of the three because it's most soluble. Um, and uh, this is what the model showed um, at, for two years after a confinement cell failure due as a result of a catastrophic storm. There's actually four results showed there. Uh, a high and low solubility and a wet and dry uh, assuming two years of wet or dry weather following the event. So they're both just superimposed on that graph. Uh, in the case of the Bannister River, it doesn't make much difference because so much of this is released and ends up in the Bannister River, it's essentially contaminated um, uh, forever. Downstream in Lake Gaston is quite a bit different. Car Reservoir upstream of Gaston and the Bannister River retain a lot of the uh, material. So what ends up passing down to Lake Gaston is only really a few percent. Uh, of the um, uh, material, but even that causes problems. That dashed red line is the Safe Drinking Water Act and Clean Water Act for radium uh, standard, and you can see this is a log scale. So you're talking about, in some cases, uh, 20 times more than the uh, Safe Drinking Water Act and uh, Clean Water Act uh, scenario, uh, and you can see that it takes about two years to, to actually to move out of the water column, <clears throat> not the sediments, and I'll talk about that briefly later. And this is right at our intake, uh, because our intake is up in a, an embayment, uh, kind of a, 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 a tributary of Lake Gaston. Uh, that tends to keep a little bit, that offers a little protection, and we actually ran the model with and without pumping. And you can see the effect. Uh, it doesn't, that little 
red line at the top of that graph, you might say that's not a very big effect, but you've got to remember it's a log scale, that's about two or three times more uh, brought into the Peel Creek area um, uh, because of our, if we pump our project during the, uh, during an event like this. So we're going to show some uh, quick videos here. And I think I'm going to stop this and get this over so you can see it. Okay, so this is modeling two years of uh, following the catastrophe in Car Reservoir, which is immediately downstream uh, uh, of this, about 50 miles downstream of the Coles Hill. Uh, red is 20 pico curies per liter, that's about four times the Safe Drinking Water and Clean Water Act standards. Uh, green is about twice the standard, and you get into the blues, you get down to uh, uh, five, and in the dark blues, it's back to background levels. Right, what you're seeing right now is the flood control operations in Car Reservoir. You can see as the reservoir is going up and down for flood control, it's pushing uh, some of those sediments, and particularly into this uh, southern tributary of Car. Uh, we did not model hydroelectric uh, power on uh, Car Reservoir. In fact, our first uh, model of Gaston did not include hydroelectric operations because they only raise and lower the lake six inches up and down a little bit. We didn't think that was significant. That's what Molly, as Scott just mentioned, that's what Molly's for, because we have modeled Gaston for hydroelectric, and we found out it was quite different. So anyway, in Car Reservoir, after two years, you, just, um, you see that uh, it took about two years to clear, and, and there was actually still some left in the water column. Again, the sediments would be different. I now need to bring back one of the next pump. Is it one of the next one? I don't want that one to run for a, a few seconds, then we'll go to the last, for about 10 seconds, then we'll go to the last one. Okay, now, we're going to let this run for about 10 seconds. Okay, go ahead and stop it now. Uh, this was our phase two modeling, which did not include hydroelectric operations. Again, gassing goes up and down about six inches each direction, a total of a foot for hydroelectric. Uh, and when we ran that model, one of the things that we saw was there was no intrusion into the tributaries. So you, the, the, the city's project is right here, the intake is right here on Peel Creek, where this big uh, uh, intersection comes together. And during that whole run, we saw no intrusion into Peel Creek and no intrusion into any of these other small tributaries. Uh, but then we ran the model with a hydroelectric component on it, and we got a very different result. So that's the one I'd like you to go ahead and bring up. Um, and uh, Car Res uh, Lake Gaston is immediately downstream of Car Reservoir. 93% <coughs> of all of Gaston's water comes from the outlet of Car Dam. At the very western end there, um, uh, that would be Car Dam, at the, uh, the far western end of, of Lake Gaston. Now you can see, uh, the, this runs a little slower because it's an hourly model instead of a daily model because we're now in hydro. And you can see a little of that pulsating. You can also see that the up and down of hydro is pushing contamination. Again, this is all in the water column, not the sediments. It's pushing that into the water. And you can see in P.O. Creek, it's slowly uh, coming up uh, and moving up. And that's because this is the model that shows our project if we chose to pump during and after this uh, uh, hypothetical catastrophe. In real world, we wouldn't, but our council wanted to know what would happen. And you'll see that that red will stop right at the intersection of these two tributaries because our project, when it pumps, takes all the water from the north and, uh, and brings up water from the uh, main body of the lake from the south. And basically, uh, we're essentially, at that point, transporting everything out of uh, Gaston into the water systems in southeast Virginia. So you'll see that red just stop right there at that intersection, uh, because, and that's because of our pump. Now, at this point in the model, we're only 200 days into the model. It will clear after about two years. And this is the dry year model. In the wet year model, it looks exactly like this, but it moves quicker. You see the, the, the system clears from the water column in months, not um, in um, years. 
But that's why we pointed out to people that if there was a catastrophe like this, we'd probably have to shut the Gaskin project down for two years during a drought. And in the last drought, it produced about a third to a half of the water for the five-city region uh, in southeast Virginia. So I won't uh, force you to see that all the way through. You can actually get it on our web page and see it. It's all pretty uh, intuitive what you'd expect to see water from upstream flushing it out. But the, the point is, this is still twice the safe drinking water level uh, and safe clean water act level, and it's been about one year. So um, we'll go ahead and go back to the presentation because I know Tom's a, uh, an issue. So uh, this sums it up. Uh, and everything I pretty much said, the big point is that all that you saw was only 10% of the contaminants. 90% of the contaminants end up um, settling because it's very heavy, and these are not particularly soluble. Uh, most of it in the Bannister River, that's why that graph of the Bannister River never ever clears. Uh, a smaller percentage of Car Lake and a smaller percentage of Gaston. But even that creates tremendous issues. This is a map of the sediment bottom uh, after two years in Car Reservoir. And you can see uh, radioactive uh, concentrations up to, um, in that area, 100 to 1,000 uh, picocuries per liter. Clean Water Act standard is 5. Uh, Gaston is a little bit better, but not a lot. I mean, as a practical matter, uh, until these uh, sediments were dredged out of the uh, uh, system, they would remain there. They would remain radioactive for hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, so, last slide. I hope I didn't take too much time. Uh, the National Academy of Sciences concluded that Virginia really wasn't ready for this. And they actually suggested that maybe even the NRC was not ready for it. Uh, to have this kind of operation with this kind of climate. Uh, the long-term impacts really aren't as much. The water column will clear, but the sediments won't. And in fact, when you look at the impact of the banister and where most of that uh, comes, certainly one of the big concerns, if you're anybody in the banister watershed, is even a small release is going to have some serious impacts on the banister river. And that's all I would have. Um, this is available on our website. There's a video you can go, uh, that, that actually uh, goes through this presentation and gives you a little bit more time and a little more, more detail. Oh, I didn't take too much time. Supply, risk, and local government. And what does that mean? And, and the Middle Peninsula PDC covers the rural portion uh, between the Rappahannock River and the York River. Uh, planning district commissions, there are 21 planning district commissions across the Commonwealth, and we exist uh, as a unit of government between local government and state government. And it becomes our job to work on the very complicated solutions that the General Assembly often brings back to local government. And so I have to work with folks like Scott when the General Assembly directs Scott at the EQ to create uh, new programs, we end up having to figure out how do we translate what those program requirements are back to local elected officials so they can make better informed decisions about what they want to do with their resources. So um, when you're looking at water supply, the real question is how is risk managed? And in local government speak, it's managed by policy. And I hear two things from people when I begin to talk about managing a risk through policy. The first side is all I'm hearing, Louie, is blah, 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 what you're saying I can't do with my land or water. So we get that a lot. And then the other side that I hear from folks saying is, why can't local government just do the right thing? Why can't they just go out there and fix it? Well, local governments don't have a moral compass. In Virginia, local governments exist as administrative arms of the state government. As a Dillard rule state, you can only do the things that the General Assembly directly mandates that local government do. So that really puts the brakes on local government's abilities to step out and do innovative things when it relates to protection of natural resources. They are not going to try new stuff. If they do, they end up in court. And that's not something the local government wants to find itself in. So it, it takes little teeny baby steps to making progress on a lot of these very sensitive issues of managing natural resources it takes a very long time. So long, in fact, one of the last points I'm going to close with is going to talk a little bit about why this is a problem for local government. So let's talk a little bit about the types of risk and how does that relate to, to water. Drought, saltwater intrusion, cones of depression, and development pressure. You know, those four types of issue areas, you hear a lot of people talking about that these types of things are really impacting our drinking water supply, especially the drought scenario. So the state legislator, legislature said several years ago, we're not going to have any more droughts without having plans in place. 
We need to know where our drinking water is, how much do we have, and where is it going to come from if everybody's pointing to the same source of water and there's not enough water there. So they directed local governments to develop water supply plans. So we again work with Scott's program, and I'm not going to steal Scott's thunder about what those programs mean. But it's important to understand that the state legislature says you've got to do this, and so local governments have to respond. So they develop the um, tools to respond to the regulatory requirements to say you've got to have a plan in place to be able to deal with that. Another water quality risk that our local governments are struggling through right now, Chesapeake Bay water quality. We have all heard about TMDL, we have all heard about Bay Agreements. And so the local governments find themselves sitting at the end of the regulatory and voluntary curve that have crossed and everything has been tried, but now local government is the last place that they have to try to fix this problem. Now, to complicate matters, local governments were not signatories to the Bay Agreement. So only the state was a signatory to the Bay Agreement. So local governments are very hesitant to take steps to move forward to make big improvements for Bay cleanup without a mandated directive from the state saying you've got to do this to clean up the Chesapeake Bay. So again, another barrier that's in place that, that causes progress to move very slowly. Declining groundwater levels. Scott can speak ad nauseum about that. When groundwater levels began to decline, that created an automatic trigger that allowed Scott to talk with um, the General Assembly to say we want to expand the Groundwater Management Act area. Most of the middle, the entire Middle Peninsula, with the exception of King William County and all of the Northern Neck and part of Northern Virginia, previously existed as unregulated communities. So essentially that meant you had a developer that came in and they wanted to take a bunch of groundwater out for business uses or a massive subdivision or whatever the case was, poke as many holes in the ground as you want, take as much groundwater out as you want, and move on. Now that local governments find themselves in a regulated environment, it's a totally different permitting process. Now if you have a developer that comes into a rural community that says, I want to open up a job, it can take anywhere from one year, two years, three years to work through the permitting process. That is a huge shift for local governments that previously were unregulated to now have to find themselves in the regulated world to protect these very important resources, but yet find a way to also have compatible economic development in a framework that is intended to be slow from the onset. And I'm sure Scott will talk some about that. The final type of risk, uh, before I pivot off to new risk, is stormwater and how local governments handle treatment of stormwater. The General Assembly consolidated water supply programs, water programs in general. So local governments now find themselves having to create new programs, figure out how do you treat and how do you manage stormwater. That's a new thing for local government. And that's a very complicated endeavor that they're having to unfold right now. Now, there are two types of new risks that are also unfolding. One is sea level rise and how sea level rise is beginning to place additional pressure on the groundwater that's there. When you get into the low-lying rural coastal communities, the water table is already at the surface. So if you begin to get more sea level rise coming in, it puts a little more pressure on that groundwater table, all of a sudden your conventional septic systems that were marginally performing are beginning to fail. When septic systems fail, that injects um, sewage into your groundwater, and you've got a whole different set of problems on your hand. There's no comprehensive policy in place to be able to look at how do you deal with the failing septic system issue that's there. That continues to be an issue that we work on at the Planning District Commission. And then a second emerging issue that's going to have some significant water quality implications is fracking. That industry um, within rural communities is going to be split. And you're going to have folks that are going to see dollar signs, and you're going to hear them say, drill, baby, drill. And on the other side, you're going to have people say, this is horrible for our water. We don't want to have this. We don't want to have tens of thousands of gallons of treated water with chemicals injected into the groundwater table. There's a lot of issues that have to be worked out as this industry begins to mature. And it is going to pose a lot of complicated questions. And there is no policy framework in place at the local level to help guide the discussion about how should communities embrace or hold off fracking. Mm -hmm. So what does this cause at the local level? Well, there's a lot of federal and state policies that are unfolding here at the exact same time. So we talked about four that are unfolding right now and two that are emerging. It, many of these started at least 25 or 30 years ago. 
So to have a mastery of the subject, it means that your staff needs to be constantly plugged in over a very long time period to be able to understand what are the implications of having all of these different overlaying regulatory programs on top of each other, what does it mean at the local level? Well, when you've got local elections and you've got elected officials washing in and out, and if you have to have 25 years of experience to understand this, and the elected official has got 25 minutes of experience dealing with this issue, it poses some tremendous challenges at the local level. So we're always having to re-educate and reframe and reinform to help our communities understand what's happening and why these regulations are in place and what this means to your community and why it's important to make good decisions and not to just say, blah, 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 what I can't do with my land or water. Because it's all interrelated. It's all very important. So that's all I've got to say. You know, that's where our local governments find themselves right now. Um, it is a very complicated time to be in local government. Thank your local elected officials if you see them, because it is a thankless job. And these things are extremely complicated, and they are not thanked enough for the work that they do. So acknowledge to them that this is complicated work, and that you understand that their job is very hard. Mm -hmm and pray that they make the best decision for your community. So thank you for your time today. I'm just going to talk today about um, declining groundwater levels in the, in the coastal plain. And one of the, um, the things that I want to be sure to, to emphasize is that this really isn't a new problem. Um, but acknowledging the nature of the problem is what I think is new. Um, so let me move on here. Um, so when I talk about um, declining groundwater levels in the coastal plain aquifer system in Virginia, what I'm talking about is the coastal plain is this nice little yellow area. Um, some people uh, who've been under the Bay Act and stuff know it as Tidewater, Virginia. Some people know it, of it as that nice little area east of I-95. However you know of it, that's the area that I'm going to talk about today. Um, one of the things... Um, this, this is kind of a um, unique system for, you know, in terms of the state of Virginia. Um, it's a unique physiographic province. It's the only um, uh, groundwater system that we have in the state of Virginia that is made up of these layered sediments that bear water that were deposited over long periods of time, either when the shoreline was out past the eastern shore, east of the eastern shore, or when the shoreline was in Richmond. And when the shoreline was in Richmond, the ocean deposited marine sediments that are finer grained and don't quite bear as much water, and those tend to be mostly our confining units. Uh, what I mean by confining units is they separate the coarser grained units that the rivers deposited uh, that bear the most water within the system. So, you know, the take home from this little message is there's pretty much a, a general layer cake design here where we have um, these layers that bear the water and layers that separate them, okay? Now, they're not homogeneous. They have holes in them. They lay on top of each other. You know, it's a lot more complex than that, but um, we have to impose that structure on it in order to simplify it to better understand how it works. Um, one of the things that, um, I, and I don't know if there's any geologists in the room. Are there any geologists in the room? Just one? Okay, well, I'm going to try not to offend you. Um, but one of the things I learned quickly um, when I took over a group of geologists is um, they never believe they know enough to make a decision about anything because it's um, more and more complex. I mean, if they had, th had it their way, then they would have a core that um, provided the sediment from the land surface all the way to the bedrock and um, in uh, every square foot across the coastal plain. Only then would they know enough to really answer the question. Um, but one of the things that has evolved over time is um, as we get the opportunity to install some more of those corals, um, we learn a little bit more. Um, when we first started managing the resource back in the 50s, you know, we had one or two of those cores, okay? As of the development of this cartoon of how the system looks and how it functions, we have about 500. So, you know, over the last um, nearly 50, 
yeah, 55 years. Um, you know, we've learned a lot more about the system, including, if you don't already know, discovering the largest impact crater um, in North America. Um, at the part of the um, uh, aquifer has been impacted um, by a, a meteor, and that um, does a lot of interesting and unforeseen things in terms of the quality of that water and how that groundwater flows through the system. So, go on to the next slide. Um, as I said, you know, this isn't a new issue. We've been looking at this issue for a long time. Um, what might be interesting to people here is, if you notice back in uh, 1913, 1945, those are publications of the state of Virginia. Those, those aren't publications of the USGS or the federal government. Um, and as we got further and further into this and you start to get into 80s and 90s and the 2000s, well, that's when water quality took over in terms of the focus of the state. Um, and therefore, a lot of this work then became contract work because all of the people that used to do the work that I do got moved into water quality. But um, here are, this just shows you that we've been looking at it a long time, we've been studying it a long time, and our understanding has changed. Um, and basically, after all of that work, what we um, have focused on are really three primary management issues. And these have been the basis of the various regulatory iterations uh, and statutory programs that the General Assembly has passed over the years. Um, since about the 19, early 1970s, the hydraulic gradient has shifted. And what I mean by that is the fresh water in the aquifer system used to flow from west to east. So the groundwater in the system used to flow from the fall line through the system, albeit very, very slowly, and come up into the Chesapeake Bay. Okay. Since about the 70s, that has reversed. So since about the 70s, the groundwater has flow, flowed from east to west. That has water quality. Okay. Saltwater intrusion, that's the main implication. Declining water levels. Um, I'm going to show you a slide in a minute that shows one of the challenges that, they, that we face, and that is that, you know, overall use of groundwater in Virginia hasn't really changed that much. It's maintained a fairly current level for a long time. Um, but what has changed is at that level of current use, uh, water levels have continued to decline for the last 100 years. Okay. So what we're seeing is even if we continue at today's use into the future, what we're going to continue to see are long-term declines in the system. And we're at a point now where um, we don't have that much head left in some places in the system before we start to do permanent damage to the water. Okay? Um, subsidence and loss of storage. One of the things that has happened from the long-term uh, pumping that we've done on the system is that uh, we have very large cones of depression. And what I mean by that is um, each withdrawal creates its own loss of pressure. Uh, within the system, and as you lose that pressure in the system, the uh, land surface sinks, okay? And what that sinking does is, one, it eliminates storage permanently in the system, but it also leads for greater potential and faster rates of sea level rise. Okay. So, um, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So, as I said, this isn't a new phenomenon, not both for the General Assembly, the, the state of Virginia, and for people using water. Um, you know, in 1956, one of the things that um, the General Assembly recognized was, hey, you know, we used to have um, basically gushers um, in the coastal plain aquifer system. If you drilled a well um, into, say, the Potomac Aquifer in 19 say 1930, 
that water would go about 140 feet into the air. Okay? Um, today, that water level in many places in the system is hundreds of feet below the water surface. Okay? So what we've lost is that storage, that head, between what it used to be and what it is today. Okay? So that was the first sign that the system was telling us, hey guys, we're taking too much water out. We're taking too much water. Okay? And so what started to happen was, okay, that artesian pressure was lost. And we no longer had it. So the General Assembly said, okay, let's pass this Virginia well capping law. So what are we going to do? We're going to require that if you abandon your well, you have to put a, a valve on it. And that valve will try to keep the pressure into the system. Well, it was kind of a good idea at the time. It represented the understanding that we had. But it wasn't very successful because it didn't really deal with the root problem. So 20 years later, we said, well, gee, we're continuing to see this change in the hydraulic radiant. We're continuing to see these declines in water levels. And oh, by the way, in 1973, we're starting to notice that in southeast Virginia and in the York James Peninsula, the Newport News, that area, gee, if we measure the salt content of the groundwater, we're starting to see higher and higher levels of salt. What's that all about? Well, that's caused by the roots. Right? So the Groundwater Management Act of 1973 was really targeted to the potential changes in groundwater quality caused by shifting that hydraulic gradient. Okay? What it did was it said, okay, we're going to create what's called a Certificate of Right program. So everybody who believes they have a right to groundwater that's currently using groundwater has to apply for a certificate. And that certificate will be built based on the maximum capacity that you have to withdraw water. Okay. Um, so what that did was that gave people a whole lot more rights than the system could hold. So it could scale. Uh, scale. So I'll talk a little bit more about that again. Then in 86, I mean, and that was just industrial uses. Then in 86, we added municipal uses because municipal uses were growing at a very high rate. Um, then we saw, oh, geez, guys, water levels are continuing to fall. So 20 years after that, General Assembly came back and said, oh, we need to change this. Let's say we're not going to have um, certificates of right anymore. Nobody's entitled to any particular groundwater withdrawal. Whatever you're granted is based on the need for that use that you can justify and the effect that you're having on the aquifer system. So that's when we had that act in 92. So that's kind of how things evolved over time. So here's a, an illustration of the change in hydraulic gradient that I mentioned earlier. You have the water flowing out this way. To, to, in this case, it's a stream, but I was talking about Chesapeake Bay. Um, you put a well in, you start to pull water from both sides, and eventually, after time, all of it comes this way. Okay. What we're seeing primarily in terms of the saltwater intrusion in um, our portion of the coastal plain aquifer is what we refer to as upcombing. Okay? And by that, we don't mean that there's this big wedge of saltwater that's being pulled into the system even though that is happening, it's happening very slowly. But what we're seeing in most cases is you have this line of salt water between fresh water and salt water, and you start pumping at the various wells, and over time, you pull that salt water up into the wells. So how many of you can tell me uh, how many groundwater desalination plants we have in Virginia? Did you even know we have them? One in Williamsburg. We have five. We have five municipal groundwater desalination. Where are they, by the way? Where are they? Um, 
Gloucester, um, Chesapeake, um, Western the, uh, Tidewater Water Authority, um, let's see, Newport News, Newport News yeah, and then uh, the James City County. So this is a report uh, that the General Assembly commissioned. Uh, they commissioned a um, geology firm back in 1979. Uh, and what this shows is in 1979, based on groundwater quality monitoring, um, this is where the line of uh, 250 milligrams a liter. Now, what's significant about 250 milligrams a liter of chloride is that's the Safe Drinking Water Act standard for chloride, okay? More than that can be a problem for people on low sodium diet or people with high blood pressure. Um, and so uh, that's the number that we try to use for, for water quality for looking at chloride. Um, in this case, this here is uh, the stash line represents the top of the aquifer, okay, so it's up here. This line here represents the bottom of the aquifer, so you, you basically have this wedge, right? All right. So here's, you know, basically um, you got uh, Norfolk area, of course, in the, that's kind of where it was on the top, and then uh, at the bottom, you're just getting into um, the Newport News area. Well, in 2010, we did a long-term study of uh, chloride levels, and this, again, the red represents the top, the blue represents the bottom. And as you can see, we probably have 40 miles of westward movement of chlorides at that concentration since 1971. Um, the other thing that you can see that I think is interesting about this uh, map is that, you know, you start to see, here's the Chesapeake Bay impact crater, and you notice how it follows along the impact crater, and how you're getting this point. Well, that point is going to one of the major pumping centers. It's kind of feeding up the York James Peninsula. Um, the other thing that is um, concerning to us about the impact crater is, the impact crater contains sediments that um, have a very high concentration of brine. And what I mean by that is you have um, chlorides and water in there that we call basically paleo seawater. So it's you know three to five times the concentration of the water in the bank you know, in terms of sediment. So um, what we don't know uh, we don't have, we haven't done enough research yet, um, is when has the gradient changed enough and the pressure lowered enough by pumping west of the crater that we release that brine into the aquifer itself. So here's a slide. Remember I told you groundwater use hasn't gone up that much? Um, we're really today still dealing with the results of this growth, okay? So the result in growth from 1930 to 1970. And the thing about the system is the system responds very slowly. So we're still seeing the impacts from growth that long ago so even if we shut off everybody's groundwater today, we're going to continue to see groundwater declines for another 40 or 50 years or more. Okay? 